The Metal Mentality Podcast is brought to you in partnership with AM300 and the Phoenix Project. For more information on both, check out am300.com slash metal. It's time for you to be the you that you know you can be and to find your metal. My name is Preston Yule, and I'm the host of the Metal Mentality Podcast. I'm a husband, a father, and American soldier. What is metal? It's your strength of character that you rely on to endure hardship. It's your grit. Together we'll learn from some dedicated, passionate, metal-minded individuals who define themselves by their grit and their graduation from suffering. Be metal. Stay metal. Hey everybody, welcome to the Metal Mentality Podcast. I'm your host, Preston Yule. And today we are speaking with an incredible man with an impressive resume. He was a Navy pilot during the Vietnam era flying a C-1A transport aircraft. He is a former Division I basketball player for the University of Oklahoma. He currently serves on the board of AM300 Solutions and serves as a military advisor board member for the U.S. Ski and Snowboard Team. He's a true entrepreneur. He's been married for about a million years to the same wonderful woman and has two children and they have pretty much adopted, not by choice, his words, not mine, Jesse Stewart. Those are Jesse Stewart's words, not mine. Please welcome Richard Bell. (laughs) Richard, how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. It's still good morning, I think. Close, yeah, because you're an hour ahead of me, so. Three minutes. I made that window by three minutes. (laughs) So. Richard, Jesse tells me that you have been uh, selected to be the narrator of his new book, The Phoenix Project, which comes coming out in June. Um, why? What role do you play in that? In that, and why were you selected to be the narrator? Um, he he could have selected somebody with a better voice. I understand that. Um, he probably selected me because I've been helping him so much over the last four years. Yeah, and he's trying to pay me back by making me look bad. <laughs> so the, the but the, the phoenix project is actually a really incredible story and from what jesse's told me is that it wouldn't he wouldn't be here without you um and that you are such a key piece in his life where does the love that you have for jesse come from what how do you have that compassion that's a short question it's a hell of a long answer <laughs> there are some similarities between jesse's family and mine um my family came to this continent in the 1650s. Um, we're talking a long time ago. Has fought in most every war we've got or have had. Have had. Um, Jesse went to ranger school in Iraq with my son, and that's how I met him in the first place. Mm-hmm. Um, I actually met him twice before I really realized who he was. Uh, met him at ranger school, met him at my son's wedding where he smacked my daughter-in-law in the butt with his sword. I found out that's a tradition, although she's still pissed about it. Um, (laughs) And the next time I saw him was after he was discharged from the army. Mm -hmm. Uh, My son called me one day and said, Hey, uh, we're going to be with you in in, in South of Denver for Christmas. Can Jesse come up for a dinner? And I said, sure. What the heck? It was my brother-in-law's house and Jesse and his wife came up and we met. And that was actually the first time, I ever got a chance to talk to him mm-hmm. and we found out that um, they were going through a possible divorce and my brother-in-law and his wife who had been through divorces and my wife and I tried to talk him out of it and say, you need to reconsider and whatever, which was a nice thing to do, but it didn't work very well. Mm-hmm. But several months later, um, my son called me and said, I need you to do me a favor. And I said, what is it? And he said, Jesse needs help. I said, okay, what does he need? <laughs> and this was when they were getting ready to go through the divorce and Jesse had been told by his lawyer to sever any ties with his Ranger buddies and the army type people that he dealt with. And so therefore he had nobody to, to deal with, nobody to talk to. And my son asked me if I would uh, fly to uh, Colorado and, and stay with Jesse for a week or so and just help him out. I said, okay. I got no golf tournament scheduled the next few weeks. Um, So I did. Um, I called Jesse, reminded him who I was. He said, yeah, he knew. And I said, you want me to come up? He said, yes, I do. And we talked a little bit. And 
<laughs> Jesse mentioned that there were some people up there that weren't all happy with him. And I said, well, do you think I need to bring a weapon with me? He said, well, if you don't mind, <laughs> I would. And so um, I took up a 45 cal Springfield uh, with three extra mags and 50 rounds extra. I did check bags, all legal, and went up to, to Colorado Springs. Jesse picked me up in his uh, super truck, a Tundra with a lift kit. I almost couldn't get in it. It was so high. And we spent the next two weeks just trying to find him a place to stay, talking to his wife, met his kids. Um, his little daughter gave me a hug. He said, Jesse, he, he t Jesse told me that was the first time she had ever hugged a man that she didn't know. Um, I have that effect on women, I guess. Um, <laughs> and so we spent time together. Um, went back home after about a week and a half or so. We kept talking and then had a few more adventures. But you ask a question, why? I grew up in a family where you help people. I was taught to help people. My father had a, a, a plant in Tennessee, phosphate plant in Tennessee, and he owned it along with my granddad. He wouldn't pay himself until all of his men were paid. He never took a nickel out of that, out of that plant unless all of his men were taken care of. He never had anybody quit on him and he never had to fire anybody. My mother taught school for her entire life, drama, English, even taught biology. Um, my parents took in a, a young lady in high school after we were all gone, graduated from high school, and raised her and put her through college just because she needed help. So I kind of grew up in that environment. And my son asked me to help Jesse, so I can't tell him no. So it started out as helping my son, ended up, and then it went to a project, if you will. And I've had a bunch of those. And then it went to an adventure, and then it ended up in something more than that, which is where we are now. That's incredible. So it was an example that was taught to you throughout your entire life. It was ingrained in you. Uh, my grandmother, my grandfather, you never met them and they didn't let you think you're the most important person in the world. Those are the type of people that I enjoy being around. And when you can meet someone and you talk with them and you know that they're super busy, but after you leave a conversation, you feel um, like what that conversation was the most important thing in the world to them in that moment. Those are the type of incredible people that we need more of. And I, I commend you for that. What, what are some of the um, struggles that you've had to overcome in your life? And how have, have you relied on your grit or your metal to get through that? Well, that's a hell of a question. Um, I'll give you the first one, the best one I got. My grandfather played water polo at the University of Illinois in the early 1900s was considered the greatest water polo player in the world. Wow. I still have a poster on our wall where they beat the University of Chicago three to two. Um, my father played basketball at the University of Illinois. Uh, my brother, who was only one year ahead of me, played basketball at Trinity University in San Antonio. I didn't want to be the only male child in my family in that century not to play a college sport. I played basketball in high school Never started. I walked on to the University of, of Oklahoma and made the team as a walk-on. I busted my ass literally for nine straight months. And I walked on and made the team. Um, I always wanted to be a Navy pilot. Had a hard time doing that. But I made it, I ended up being third out of 367 student pilots that I went into flight wow. school. Um, didn't know what I was going to do out of, out of the military. My wife, I started a business um, after a few years. My wife and I built it. We sold it, and I retired when I was 50. Never had a plan. Jesse has a plan. I understand that. I never had a plan. I just kind of went with what happened and made the best of it. Um, I never quit. My 
My grandfather taught me that. He was born in 88, 1888. When he was 11, his father, my, grand, my great-grandfather, was shot in the back and killed. Wow. Southern Illinois. He had a, had a ranch, had a farm. Also had a saloon. And one night he kicked a drunk out and the guy waited for him and shot him in the back, killed him. Hmm. So at age 11, my grandfather had to raise his three younger sisters and take care of his mother. He ended up graduating from high school while he was in college at the University of Illinois, early 1900s, and got a master's, an engineering master's uh, at the same time. In concrete, I have his thesis. He built most of the highways in, in, in the Northern Midwest. They were brick when he started, concrete when he ended. Henry Ford actually asked him to buy a piece of Ford Motor Company. He turned him down. Um, if he hadn't turned him down, if he, if he had not turned him down, you and I would not be talking. Uh, but he never quit. He worked until he was 85 because he lost everything in, in the crash of 29. Picked up his bag and went back to work building highways. He never quit. My dad did the same thing. Had all kinds of problems after the war. Built a business then lost it, kept going, won't quit. So I was kind of taught that through family history. Hell, I even had an uncle killed at the Alamo a long time ago. Um, so when I started working with, not working with Jesse, that's the wrong term. When Jesse and I got together and started this little journey, you can't stop once you start something if you think that the end is worth it. Yep. Um, and I've had some people I've tried to help in the past where the end wasn't worth it. And with Jesse's situation, yeah, it was worth it and I wasn't going to quit. And so we, we have turned this into quite a journey, if you will. Yeah, it's, it's really impressive, actually, the relationship that you have, uh, father-son relationship uh, you know not not all families blood related and from what i know of you two and uh, that he's your son and you're his dad you're that father figure for him and that's incredible that i think we need more people in this world with a compassion that have that level of compassion and willing to help as well as never quitting and i think that that's really what one of the main key points of what i'm trying to do with this podcast is teach people to never quit if the end is worth it, never quit. If, if fighting for yourself is worth it, which it is, you can't quit on yourself. So you played, played division one basketball. Did you, did you ever get to the point where you were starting? Oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> um, a six foot tall white guy who can't jump and is relatively slow. Um, it's a hard time ever starting. Now, I was told one time that I was so slow, I was deceptively slow. <laughs> that I could fake people out with my slowness. They thought I was faking, but I was really going. <laughs> um, but I played, I played all the way through the Navy and, and won fifth Naval District Championship, high score. I mean, I got better as I went on because I played smart. I didn't play with talent. I just played smart. And, and I was a good team defensive player. Um, played 5-0 tennis. I got a four handicap in golf at one time. So I'm a decent athlete, but short, couldn't jump, not quick. But I worked at it. And the, the, the coach at Oklahoma put me on the team because I made an all-state player from Oklahoma who was a freshman look like an idiot on one play. And that's why I, I, that's why I got picked to, to, as a walk-off. So it was your grit, you know, determination of like, I'm going to make this team no matter what. It's almost like the movie Rudy. Like, have you seen that movie? I'm not saying that, but you know what I'm getting at, right? Like he just had that heart of like, I'm never going to quit. I'm going to keep going. This is important to me. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to it give it my all. It was important to me to play, not necessarily start. Because like I say, my grandfather, my father, my brother all played at college sport. And I wasn't going to be the only one not to. And whether I ever started or not, I knew I wouldn't. It was important to me to play. 
That was the goal. It was important to me to be a Navy pilot. That was the goal. I grew up wanting to be a Navy pilot. And, you know, I wasn't going to, I was never going to quit. I, I, I cut a couple of corners. Truth be known. <laughs> um, but I did. It. And I had a good, I had a good career flying in the Navy. Enjoyed the hell out of it. Landed on 10 different aircraft carriers. Wow. All of them are either uh, razor blades or museums now. None of them are still in active service. I mean, we are talking a half a century ago. Yeah, yeah, it was a while ago. Yeah. So what, what, how was your medal shaped even more uh, becoming a Navy pilot? Um, flying is, to me was fun. That's why I haven't flown much since I got out. Because the kind of flying I like to do gets you killed. You know, like flying down a, a dry creek bed at 50 feet, you know, as fast as you can go. Um, and I wanted a family, and I knew if I kept flying, I probably wouldn't make it, so I quit. But I was an instinctive pilot. I just knew how to fly. I could fly ahead of the airplane. And I had several situations um, where I could have been killed, and I had passengers in the back, um, and their lives depended on me being good. And those things, those things happen in an instant. And if you're good, if your reaction times are fine, if you understand what to do and you're trained well, then you can survive those. And I was able to do that really without a problem. Um, getting through some of those emergencies made me realize that I really was as good as I thought I was. So getting through those emergencies, uh, those instincts, they, they forged your character even more, realizing that you're capable of doing things that you didn't have to quit. Is that, would that be accurate? It made me realize that I could do whatever in the heck I wanted to do as long as I was willing to do it. Um, it made me realize that I was as good as I thought I was. And I guess it, in, in life, Anybody can believe they can do anything, but until you actually are in a situation where you have to do something and your life depends on it and you're able to do it, you really don't know how good you are. It's not ego. It's just confidence. Yeah. I can do this. I don't need to worry about it. I know I can do it. And therefore you continue to do it. And when I got into the business world, I never had, I never had a question. Had some, had, some, had some situations that were not good uh, where a, a company went down and I had to go find something else to do and whatever, but I always knew instinctively that I was going to make it work. And like I said, my wife and I built a business and we retired at 50. I always figured out one way or another how to make what I wanted to happen, happen. And so was that because you had a commitment and a determination? I never, I maybe couldn't articulate it to somebody, but I knew where I wanted to end up. I knew what I wanted to do. And I was able to get through whatever trials and tribulations that I had mm -hmm. to get there. And that's really what's going on with Jesse right now. Trying to figure out a way to get through all the trials and the tribulations to get not to the end game, but, but to make everything work. Yeah. That I think, Many of us, uh, especially in society, we, we quit uh, when it gets uncomfortable. Like we're not okay with things being uncomfortable. So why, why do you think, uh, in your opinion, is America as a whole, are we less resilient than we once were? Or what's your opinion on that? I'll answer your question, yes. Uh, we're not as resilient as we once were. I'll tell you one thing my father told me years ago. My freshman year in college, I took classes I shouldn't take. I had five hours of F in an advanced math class because a counselor told me major in math. And so my first semester when I was also playing ball, I had a one point close to, you know, checking out of college. So over Christmas, sitting down with my dad, he says, son, I need you to answer one question for me are you doing the best that you can? 
if you say yes, then that's fine with me. If you say no, you're not, then I expect better. That was the last time you ever had to talk to me about how good I did. Yeah. That, clearly that conversation had a huge impact on your life. It seems as if it almost shaped your character. Would you say that that was one of the most impactful conversations you've ever had? Uh, with him, yes. I never talked to my father that much. He traveled from Monday morning to Friday night. Um, difficult growing up. So fourth grade, that's what he did. I do remember one time, um, we gave my, my brother and I gave my mother crap during the week. When we were in high school, my father came home on a Wednesday night. He never did that because we had been disrespectful to my mother. He walked into our bedroom, we're standing there. He grabs each one of us by the collar. Now my dad was 6'3 and about 250. His nickname was Big Rodney. <laughs> the kids didn't say that to his face. He grabbed us by the collar and literally picked us up and pinned us against the wall. And he said, if I ever have to come back here again in the middle of the week because you're disrespecting your mother, I will beat the crap out of both of you. He set us down, walked out, and went back to work. He never had to come back in the middle of the week. You don't disrespect your mother. You do the best you can. And you don't quit. Man, I'm, I'm so moved by what you're sharing right now. It's, it's so powerful. Um, what do we need to do as an American society to help us become more resilient again? Rebuild families. I, 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 you've got to rebuild families. If you have a father and a mother that are working, that are doing something and they, they teach their kids to be responsible, then they end up being responsible. The problem we have that I can see is, and I'm, I'm 73 years old, I've, I've seen a lot. Um, like I told somebody, if, if it's more than a number two pencil and a legal pad, it's way too much technology. But things have changed since I grew up. I don't think people are as responsible as they should be. I don't think they, they, they teach their kids what they should. There's too much hedonism, if you will. What's in it for me? Yeah, entitlement. Uh, take a look at Europe. I mean, Europe has gone in the toilet because they're hedonists. They, it's all me. So you ask a question and it, I don't think that's going to happen. I really don't, but if it could, that would be the answer. So how, so I'm a, I'm a parent of three children. My wife and I've been married for 13 years. What advice would you offer someone in my situation or a listener who might be in the same situation to teach their children to be resilient? How do we teach our kids to be resilient? Um, every time I see somebody with a little kid in the shopping line, whatever, I tell them this is the easiest it's ever going to be. It never gets easier and it never gets cheaper. And mine are 40 and 38, and I can testify to both of those two. Um, what I would tell you, or somebody like you, is to teach your kids to do what they say they're going to do. But you got to show them by example that you're doing the same thing. <laughs> you got to teach them right from wrong. And there is right from wrong. I also wouldn't let mine, if I had new ones, be on YouTube and, and Twitter and the rest of that stuff, you know, as much as they are. Um, my wife's going through cancer treatment. I was at the, the place the other night, and there were 20-some people in there, and every one of them was on a device. Nobody talking to anybody. So I speak up, and I go, I go and you guys want to talk about what's going <laughs> on? And literally six or seven people turn them off, and we start talking. 
the interaction between people is lacking. Uh, nobody talks to anybody anymore. Yeah. They just deal over the internet with, with nondescript entities. Teach your kids to get off their devices and deal with people as people. And if, they say, if they say they're going to do something, make sure they do it and then show them the good example. To teach them to play when they're young rather than to watch other people play on devices. Oh, yes. Um, my mother told me that when I was in the fourth grade, I had saved up my allowance for months. I got a dime a week. Now, this Let's make money back then. It's in early 50s. And I funded a Easter egg hunt for some neighbor kids that didn't have as much as we had. Bought all the Easter eggs, hit them, got them all over there so they could find them. She also told me when I was 13, I did the same thing in, in Dallas, Texas. I saved up my allowance and I built or funded an Easter egg hunt for kids that didn't have what we had. Did it on my own. Nobody told me to. Just did it. Teach your kids how to take care of other people. Teach your kids how to be responsible. Teach your kids that they're not the most important person in the world. Others are. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I'm emotional right now hearing that. Um, what you're saying is 100% true. And teach them to have fun. And you could, that's, you could have fun when you're serving other people, right? 100%. Like, oh, yeah. I, I find more joy... Um, and doing something for others than I do doing things for myself. And um, that's something I'm trying to teach my, my children as well. And uh, they're sometimes reluctant to do that. <laughs> so I have three kids. I have two daughters and a son. My oldest uh, is Lila. She's nine years old. And then she actually jumped on the recording last night with Jesse and shared a story. And uh, she is incredible. Um, she's in third grade. My daughter uh, that was just six. She's, her name is Eva and she's five. Uh, and my little boy, uh, he's two and a half. His name is Benson. He's a little ginger redhead, and he's just the cutest thing in the his world. Is, his name is Benson. I thought you said Pez, like the dispenser, but that's all right. Yeah, we love Pez candy around here, so we named him Pez. <laughs> <laughs> no, his name is Benson. He's a cute little boy. Yeah, it's funny because um, all of my kids kind of had reddish hair when they were born, right, right when they came out. And uh, I was kind of worried that they were going to get picked on and stuff. It was just the whole ginger thing. And then uh, he came out and he had the same color hair. I was like, oh, it'll change. And my, both my girls are, don't have red hair at all now. And, but, he, uh, uh, but he's a very much, yeah, yeah. He's a little, he's a little strawberry blonde. And uh, he doesn't have the orange hair, but he's got the strawberry blonde. And uh, uh, so there was, that was kind of a shock for me. And uh, I wouldn't have it any other way because that the, his hair, it's like, it just, it fits him. It's who he is. You know what I mean? And um, <laughs> <laughs> he's just a riot. And uh, he's a loving enjoy, little boy. Enjoy them while you have them when they're young. It, it, you know, and I realized that many times um, I take a lot of those opportunities for granted because it, being a parent is the hardest thing I've ever done. Um, but at the same time, it's, it's the most rewarding thing I've ever done. I've, I've never done anything more rewarding. And I'd say being married is, is on the same level as that. It, it's also the hardest thing I've ever done. And it's also the most rewarding thing I've ever done. And what I've realized is that um, the the things in life that have the greatest value are the hardest to do. And if it's not difficult to do, the reward's not that great. If something is easy, then you take it as being easy. If you succeed at something that's hard, then you feel pretty good about it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's a, you know, I've been married for 13 years and throughout that time, my, my marriage has not been perfect. Um, <laughs> I tell you that much. And anybody who has a perfect marriage, I don't think they have a marriage. Uh, I mean, everybody has trials they go through, but that has really helped me put things in perspective where um, I try to cherish every moment that I have with my kids uh, because in a moment they, it could be gone. Like something could happen and I could lose them or I would be gone. We kind but, of all learned that this last weekend. Say that again. We kind of all learned this that this last weekend. How so? 
the helicopter crash. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Father, yeah. daughter. Yeah, with Kobe Bryant it, it, passing. Yeah, it, it can end in an instant. And and I think that's why we can't ever be ungrateful for what we have. We always have to have gratitude for what we have. Um, well, they say you can't change the past. You can't predict the future. All you have is the present. And that's why it's called the present. It's from God. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, so when um, my wife told me um, when we things were, uh, I hit rock bottom and I said, I, I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I, I, I'm not going to get over this. Uh, the one thing she said to me was, I'm sorry you have to go through this. Knowing that she was hurting because of the pain that I caused her, she said, I'm, I'm sorry you have to go through this. And um, she fought for me. And there's still even times now where, uh, I, you know, I, I forget that, that she did that for me. I forget that um, she's never quit on me. And she never will. My wife is the most loyal person I've ever met in my entire life. Loyal to the point where sometimes it annoys me. <laughs> <laughs> but it yeah. is a true strength of character that she has that I admire. And she's passing on to my children. And, um, but now I, I come home from work. When I come home from work, my kids are, uh, they, they hear me hang up my keys and the door shut and they come running, dad, dad, dad. And the dog comes and starts barking. And now my nine year old's at that point where she's like, hi dad. And I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> she's got other things to do. Right. But I, so, someone, I heard someone say somewhere, um, hug your children and pick, pick up your children as much as possible because one day you'll pick your child up for the last time. And, uh, I, I took my daughter to the hospital or not the hospital, the doctor on Sunday, she had strep throat. We were at the, in the urgent care and she said, um, she got a shot in the leg and she said, dad, will you carry me to the car? And she, they just weighed her. She weighed 77 pounds. And I, I was thinking, <laughs> That's a lot of weight to carry that far. And I said, yeah. And I picked her up and I carried her to the car. By the time I got to the car, I was like, <laughs> I was pretty smoked just because it was dead weight in the way she was hanging and she wasn't helping me out, out at all. And I, I had that thought that this could be the last time I picked my daughter up. Well, the, um, there's also reverse to that. At one point in time, they're going to be picking you up. Yeah. Although you're not as close to it as I am. No, I'm half your age about, so <laughs> I got a while, but yeah. So, what, you're, you're 26? Do I look like I'm 26? I, I think I look older oh, than that. Oh, you, you can't see all my gray hair in the, in this video, but no, I'm, I just turned 35. So are Good, you 52? Man. Is that what you're saying? You're 52? Is that what you're trying to tell me? I never said that. Never said that. <laughs> so, I'm, 73 well, going, I'm 73 going on 12. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, it, it is. It is written that you must grow older. It is not written that you must grow up. That is, <laughs> I like that a lot. Yeah. So let's talk about. We've, we've talked a lot about concept of a family and tribe. But why is it important that we bring other people in and help them? To be selfish is probably the worst thing you can be. And everybody is selfish to a point. If you're not, then you never do what you want to do. But just to be selfish means you won't help somebody else unless that helps you. And that's selfish. You help somebody else because they need it, because they want it. And to be honest, because it makes you feel good, which is being selfish to a point. Um, you are not, not you specifically, the generic you are not the most important thing in the world. Other people are. If you help others, then I do believe it will come back. Pay it forward, pay it back, whatever you want to call it. But if you help others, then one way or another, it will come back to you. So why not do that? 
You don't do it for your own self-interest. You do it because you ought to do it. You do it because you probably need to do it. You do it because you want to do it. And you do it because it makes you feel good. And it will, one way or another, sooner or later, sometime, come back to you. That's why you help other people. Now, I'm not saying that you have to help everybody that's out there because nobody can. Nobody has unlimited resources, even George Soros or Bloomberg or any of those guys. Nobody has unlimited resources. So you have to take what you have. You got to pick and choose. And then you do what you can in that environment. Uh, I really like that. That I, My wife and I were driving. Um, through rush hour in downtown Provo yesterday. And we saw a lady, um, it was fairly cold out. She was sitting on, a, on the steps of a, an old building, uh, had a shopping cart. She's wrapped up in a blanket. And my wife turned to her and she said, oh, a poor lady. And I thought that would be so terrible to be in that situation. And uh, I thought, I wish I could help her not be in that situation. But I looked at uh, at what my capabilities were to be able to help her. And I, I didn't really have any, I didn't have any cash on me. Um, I, I can't bring her into my house and I, I don't know her situation. And uh, it was just in a fleeting moment as we drove past. And I, I wish there would have been something I could have done for that person in that moment. But we kind of have this emotional bandwidth, so to speak, as limited in how much we can help other people. And we got to pick and choose where we place that bandwidth. And I think that when we have those promptings for this is where you need to help, uh, we miss out on a lot of opportunities if we ignore that. So during the Vietnam era, you, you flew a uh, transport aircraft, the a A6. I flew, I, I flew what was called a C1A, which was a twin engine prop cargo plane on and off aircraft carriers taking people, mail, and cargo to the ships at sea. Um, mainly passengers, sometimes, you know, ammunition, missiles, almost had a chance to carry out a nuclear weapon one time <laughs> until the Marines figured out it wouldn't fit in the plane. That was fun. Um, <laughs> but I was carrying people. Have you ever landed on an aircraft carrier? Uh, no. I mean, oh, no. Okay. I flew uh, in a C-130 and I flew in a, in a KC-135. But I have not. A C-130 actually landed on the Forrestal in 1959. Wow. Biggest airplane to ever do that. But I carried, I, f I flew onto carriers taking out people, cargo, a lot of mail, um, sometimes weapons, whatever. But I always had, for the most part, passengers in the back. And so I'm landing on an aircraft carrier. They can't see it because they're facing backwards. And their lives were in my hands to make sure that they lived. I'll tell you a quick story. We were flying out to the Independence off of Jacksonville, Florida. Um, you may edit this out, you may not, but we closed down the Oak Club and went back to get our gear to go to our airplane for an early launch. We got to the plane and sucked oxygen for an hour. Uh, oxygen helps you <clears throat> get your mind back after closing down the Oak Club. And our passengers that day was a two-star Air Force general, his chief of staff, and four others of his staff. We had to fly him out to the Independence. They had never been in a plane like mine. They had never been out to a carrier. So at 5.30 in the morning, they show up and we launch. I decided to take a nap on out to the carrier. Um, just trying to recover from you know, the exertion of closing down the Oak Club. Um, halfway out to the boat, this two-star general climbs up into my cockpit and I'm taking a nap and he wraps on my helmet. And I wake up and turn around and see this two-star looking at me and I'm going, oh crap, he knows what I was doing last night. And so I take off my helmet and I look at him and I say, yes, sir, what can I do for you? And he goes, Lieutenant, I got a question for you. 
And I'm going, oh, shit, here it comes. Yes, sir, what is it? He goes, do you care about us back here in the back? Mm -hmm. And I look at him and I go, no, sir, I don't. And he looks at me and he goes, excuse me? And I say, General, the way I see it is if I land on that carrier, you have got to come with me. And he goes, I don't like that answer. <laughs> and he went back in the back and sat down and I called my crewman and go, Joe, who's six, six and about two forty, If that son of a gun comes into my cockpit again, I'm having your stripes. <laughs> he can, he can tell me where to fly. He can't tell me how to do it. Um, the, the answer to your question is I flew people, their lives were in my hands. There were several situations where we could have all died. And because I was a good pilot, I was a great pilot. Nobody died. Um, there was a captain of one of the carriers that was relieved for cause because of what he did to me. And that's a story for a different time. Oh, we got time. All right. I was flying off the Lexington off Pensacola, Florida. I was taking seven pilot trainees, if you will, off the Lexington back to the beach. I was the last launch of the day. Back then they called it a deck run. I didn't need a catapult because my plane was good enough not to need a catapult. And when we were taking off, I'd been told there'd be 29 knots of wind over the deck, which is plenty enough for me to launch. There wasn't 29, there was only 15. So when I went off the deck, there was not enough wind for me to fly. Technically, I needed 16 minimum if I was lucky. So I, I pulled the wheel back to go up. Nothing happened. So immediately, I pushed the wheel forward towards the water. You're not taught to do that. It was just instinct. Go down, pick up airspeed, try and come back. And we did. Got down literally where my props we're kicking up spray out of the ocean. We passed the front of the front of the boat below the deck. Went on out to a safe altitude, 50 feet, which seemed safe at the time, and called the carrier. And they finally answered after the third call. And they told me that I had 15 knots of wind. We flew on back. To the, to, the, to the beach, drop them off, and they called, say, we need another load, we need another cod back out here, we got more people to take, take to the beach, so I went out again. Flying to the carrier, um, the air boss got on the line with me and said, are you the cod that had a problem here earlier? And I said, yeah, you, you could call it that, and he goes, I want you to know it was not my fault, I was not on the, I was not on the tower at the time, I didn't do it. <laughs> So we get those people, we take off, we go back, we get up to Navy Norfolk. My CO meets the plane as we taxi in and he goes, Lieutenant, we got to go see the three-star Admiral right now. Okay. So we go to the Admiral's office, Admiral Michaelis, who's head of all air operations, Navy Atlantic. We walk into his office. The CO of the ship had said it was my fault. He had blamed me. The videotape had been, it disappeared. That's so we walk into the Admiral's office and Admiral Michaelis looks at me and goes, hey, Richard, how you doing? Admiral, I'm doing fine. What can I do for you? Did you do anything wrong off the Lex? I said, no, sir, I didn't. He goes, that's all I needed to know. Thank you. We had just won the fifth Naval District Championship the week before in basketball, and I'd been at his house drinking beer. <laughs> <laughs> and so I didn't know him. And Friends in the right places. <laughs> right place, right time. <laughs> CEO of that ship was relieved for cause the next day. Wow. So I didn't learn a lot in Vietnam because I never was in country, but I did do things that were life-changing experiences, if you will. And that was one of them. That's the day I realized I was a damn good pilot. 
because it wasn't what I was taught, it was what I, I instinctively did. Now, That's I will it. tell you just a fraction about Navy training, flight training. My co-pilot told me that I took my hands off the throttle. I got one hand on the wheel, one on the throttle. His hand's behind mine on the throttle to keep it full bore. He said, you pulled your hand out and you went to the tail hook. And then you went back to the throttle. And I said, no, I didn't. It took me two weeks to remember that that's exactly what I did because in the training that you go through, if you ditch it, see, you pull the tail hook down. It'll hit first, you get a little jolt, so you know you're gonna land. And I went back to the throttle because I thought in my mind, if I pull the tail hook down and it hits the water, that's enough to take us in, so I didn't do it. it took me two weeks to remember that, that I actually did that. It was just instinctive flying. So, and there were a few other things that I did. Like I said, I, I, I was never in country. I did fly a SEAL team for a year on their missions, on their training missions. I flew a uh, Marine recon team on some of their training missions. There were some interesting situations there. Well, well, do you tell? Um, my last flight in the Navy was flying a Marine recon team on a training mission. My last flight. My co-pilot was his first flight in the squadron. <laughs> we took out a Navy Norfolk. We canceled our IFR clearance and went VFR, visual flight rules, to head to this field that was, you know, out in the middle of nowhere, a little triangular field. Um, we had a, that's the only time we got to play. So I'm doing, I hit full power, 5,000 feet down to the deck, over the pine trees, down the runway at 20 feet, blowing and going. The Marines are sitting there on the side of the runway, you know, just watching us blow by. And my co-pilot, his first time there, is punching me in the shoulder and pointing out the front. He forgets we have an intercom. He's punching me in the shoulder, pointing out front. I look up and here's a crop duster on my nose coming directly at me <laughs> at about 30 feet off the ground. I pull straight up. I mean, literally straight up in a cod, tough to do. The crop duster does a barrel roll over the trees, disappears. No idea what happened to him. We come back around and land, and the Marines are laughing their asses off because of what just happened. They get in the airplane, 13 of them fully loaded, 75 pound packs. Oh, which one is that? This is Eva. Eva, this is Richard Bell. He's a. Hello, Eva. Sure. How are you doing? But she can't hear. You want to talk to her for a second? You want to hear her? Put the headphones on. You can hear her. Come sit up here. He's telling us a, st a story. <laughs> this is my daughter, Eva. She's five. I've got three little granddaughters. One of them is seven, <laughs> one is three and a half, and one is one and a half. I was totally uh, unexpected. <laughs> uh, she is so pretty. Oh, thank you. She is so pretty. <laughs> and I couldn't tell her what happened because of some of the language that was involved. But that's all right. <laughs> So you're saying the Marines are laughing. What happened? Oh, they're laughing their butts off. They get in the airplane. They're fully loaded, 13 combat-loaded Marine recon team, which means I'm overloaded. It's a hot summer day. They get in, and the, and the, the sergeant, first sergeant, whatever his rank was, gets on the intercom and goes, um, Lieutenant, uh, just, just to make it clear, uh, if, if you've got a problem on takeoff, just get us to 500 feet. We will exit your aircraft. I go, okay, fine. So we go back, take off. I raise my landing gear and it doesn't come up. It comes up unsafe. Well, the only thing you can do is put it back down because if you keep trying to put it up, it'll lock up and then you got real problem. So my gear is down, I am overloaded, it's a hot day, there aren't a lot of lifties in the air and I am just barely kind of motivating out over the, <laughs> the trees. And so I call back to the sergeant and say, Sergeant, I can't get my gear up. When I had 500 feet, exit my aircraft, silence. <laughs> it, it's probably only about two or three seconds. It seemed like about 20. Uh, Lieutenant, um, sir, um, if you don't mind, can you please get us to a thousand feet? <laughs> <laughs> and so we, we, we just, we just keep going out over the trees. I don't turn, you turn, you lose lift. So I just keep going straight. We get to a thousand, actually, I think 1200 and they exit the aircraft. None of them died. Otherwise I'd have heard about it. <laughs> so they jump out. We go back, now I've got an unsafe nose gear. There's a 
panel in the front of my airplane between the co pilot and co pilot. You take it off and you can see the gear and it's flipped backwards, but it's not 180 degrees backwards. It's like 160 degrees backwards and reversed. So you land with that, it could collapse. I got a big prop over here turning. When that prop hits the ground, it'll break off and come right through the cockpit. So I spend two hours burning gas, so we don't want to land with a, and have a you know, big bang with a full fuel tank. One of the lieutenants in my squadron suggested we get a deuce and a half to run down the runway, and I will lower my nose into the bed of the deuce. <laughs> and I said, if you can find somebody stupid enough to drive that truck, we might give it a shot. We came in and landed, and I held the nose off as long as possible. Got down to about 50 miles an hour before it touched down. Turned right with the tires going the other way. Yeah. Taxi down, pull into the spot, park it perfectly on the square. The wheels are burning. The tires are now, they caught fire. They come out, they hose it down. I get out of the airplane, kick that burning tire, and walk in and say, I'm done. That's my last flight. <laughs> It so sounds like the three, stuff like a movie or something. I had three emergencies in my last flight. That's one of the reasons I quit flying. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> no, no more time for that. Well, well, I appreciate your time today. And uh, I have just a couple more questions for you. If, if, if someone, uh, what would you say to someone right now if, who's listening to this, if they find themselves in a position where they're about ready to quit on themselves or give up on life or quit their passion, what would you say to them? Well, the easy answer is don't quit. The other one is find somebody you trust and sit down and talk to them. Tell them what your situation is. Tell them what you're thinking. Ask for their advice. And then don't quit. Find somebody to talk to. It could be a father, it could be a friend, it might even be your wife, although I know that's difficult. Find somebody to talk to, to air it out. And then you have to ask yourself if what you want is truly worth the effort. If it is, then you got no choice but to go for it but you got to be honest with yourself. You have to be totally honest with yourself as to whether or not it's worth the effort, whether or not that's really what you want to do. Oh, well, that's great advice. The last question I have for you is let's pretend that in the next 30 seconds, whatever you say is, will be heard and understood by every single person on the earth. What do you say? One is I don't speak Chinese. Um, we need to figure out a way to get along with each other. We need to figure out a way not to put our own self-interest ahead of everybody else's. This world will go to hell in a handbasket if we don't do that. There's too much animosity. There's too much hatred. There's too much derision and it's got to stop one way or the other i like that a lot well richard i thank you so much for your time your entertaining stories your words of wisdom you clearly have lived a life full of experience for sharing with others and i'm sure uh, uh, your time and uh being on this podcast will touch the lives of many people and uh, appreciate you you being here I do hope it was worth your time hey guys be sure to follow the Metal Mentality Podcast on social media and as always if you find value in the show please leave a review and rate us 5 stars on Apple Podcasts but more importantly share this podcast with someone you know who would benefit from the messages from the guests on each episode you can find us on Instagram Facebook and Twitter at Metal Mentality